If a picture is worth a thousand words, our faces write a story with each expression. And mental health experts rely on their ability to read our expressions, our body language, and even our voices to help diagnose depression. There's no diagnostic tests that say, yes, this person has depression. But when I'm talking to you, if I'm depressed, I convey that to you through changes in voice, facial expression, body movement, my eyes might be downcast, I might make poor eye contact. These are the signs that indicate depression, and it's up to the clinician to recognise such patterns in speech and appearance to make an accurate diagnosis. It's a subjective approach with inherent limitations. So we've relied on those sorts of clinical judgments, and clinical judgments are very dependent on the training and the sophistication or the idiosyncrasies of the practitioner. They're like a robot whose light has gone out. GPs actually are responsible for most of the diagnosis and the level of knowledge and experience of doctors varies a lot in the community. So we do know that we're missing diagnosis. That's why a team of leading clinicians and computer scientists is developing a more objective approach, where cameras and microphones become the eyes and ears of the clinician. It's all made possible by recent advances in what's known as effective computing. Now, what that means is developing systems that can read and understand and analyse the affect, so the emotions, the mood of the persons that they are looking at, and quantify what's going on. It's the same pattern recognition that clinicians currently use, but it's recorded by modern technology and analysed using sophisticated software. It's a lot of analysis of facial expressions, let's say a smile or a surprise, and building an understanding of what are actually the facial models, the muscles underneath that make this happen. The theory behind that is that for a lot of people with depression, they're suffering from something called psychomotor retardation. And that really means that the control and the use of muscles in the body changes as a result of the depressed state. We often talk about the frozen face and depressed people, so a reduced amount of facial expressions. And the vocal cords and the vocal expressions, we have a reduced amount of expressivity. There's difference to the volume, there's difference to the speaking rate, there's difference, for example, to the degree of, of variation in the, in the pitch or the, the melody of the speech. There are those kinds of changes, and then there are also much more subtle changes that are a little more complex to describe, but we can extract them using mathematical techniques. The team's largest study to date has assessed over 130 people, half diagnosed with depression in varying severities and a control group with no history of depression. We get people to watch movies. So they watch sad movies, they watch happy movies, they watch boring movies. I'll start playing the video clips now. Oh. And we're filming everything about their affect. That involves eye movement, eyebrows, blinking, smiling, flushing, heart rate changes. It's a wealth of information that we get. And we found that is to be really working very well because the spontaneous reactions from people, that is really where the key information in relation to depression lies. The other thing we do is we get someone to come in and interview them about their recent experiences, things that make them happy, things that make them sad. So we look at that interaction. How much does the person respond? Can you tell me about some recent good news? So it's basically everything that you can catch with a camera on a microphone that clinicians are already using. We're very happy with our results. What we found is that if we just use individual cues, so let's say just facial expressions or just eye movements, we can reach up to about 80% agreement with the clinical opinion. Now, the interesting part really happens when we bring these different measures together. So let's say we combine facial expressions with the eye movements, with the head movements, with the vocal expressions, then we can reach up to 95% agreement with the clinical opinion. 
The team is also working to measure the grade of the depression. This will help identify the more severe forms, like the disease state of melancholia, which the team has also analysed using brain imaging. Where I think the great importance of the research will be in being able to decide who's got that disease type depression, melancholia, where it's a very physical state, extremely physical. And for many centuries, it was actually more defined as a movement disorder than a mood disorder, because of the way in which the face appeared immobile, there was a lack of light in the eyes. So most people think when you get depressed, you get sadder than usual. That can be the case, but when you get melancholia, people actually lose emotion and they describe a complete loss of feeling and a dead feeling. And so what we see in that very severe type of depression, yet yeah, people don't look as happy when they watch a happy film, but they don't look sad when they watch a sad film. They just look the same more or less the whole time. And in the brain imaging we do, we see very distinctive signatures as well in those people. So if we can come up with a system that detects the actual facial changes, and certainly our preliminary analyses are extremely encouraging, then that will aid diagnosis. And the distinction is of fundamental importance because the management of melancholia is not the same. The aim for the next several years is to take their tracking technology out of the lab and begin a large-scale trial involving doctors and patients. We're not talking about replacing clinicians at all. We're talking about something that a GP might have in their room or that a patient might have on their phone or at home that can add additional information about maybe how they're responding to treatment, how they're feeling in the morning rather than the afternoon because that variation is important. So we're looking at embedding apps and other low-cost technology in people's everyday lives to help them monitor their own depression and to improve the diagnosis of depression. We're very confident that we're on the right path um, to see this going into practice. And it's very exciting work to see that we're now at a point where technology can really assist people in their lives and have a major impact in their lives. If this program has raised personal concerns, you may wish to contact one of these counselling services for further information or advice.